Welcome to Personal Landscapes. I'm your host, Ryan Murdoch. You can find links for today's episode and other conversations on books about place at ryanmurdoch.com. Leslie Downer first went to Japan as an English teacher in the late 1970s. She immersed herself in the language and developed a keen interest in the haiku of Matsuo Basho. Years later, she followed the route the poet had written about in his 17th century book, Oku no Hosomichi, On the Narrow Road to the Deep North. Her travels took her from Tokyo's drab industrial concrete to what was then a seldom visited part of northern Japan, and her book about this journey was reissued by Eland in 2024. Leslie is the author of On the Narrow Road to the Deep North, Journey into a Lost Japan, a recent book called The Shortest History of Japan, The Novel Sequence, The Shogun Quartet, and other books. She has also presented documentaries on the BBC and on NHK in Japan. We spoke about Basho's famous haiku, modern-day mountain aesthetics, and Japan's undiscovered north. One quick housekeeping note before we jump in. I've mentioned on previous episodes that I have a new book out this year. It's called A Sunny Place for Shady People, and it's about six years I spent living on the island of Malta. I wrote it to help outsiders understand how a journalist could be assassinated in a European Union member state, how those who hated her could celebrate her death, and why the people behind it continue to evade justice. It was written with a foreign audience in mind and published in the U.S., but it's now available locally in Malta in a paperback edition from Mid-Sea Books. You can find more information about it on my website. I hope you'll check it out. And now, here's my conversation with Leslie Downer. So I think we should start by setting the scene for listeners who aren't familiar with Japan. So who was Matsuo Basho? So Basho was a very, very famous um, poet who lived in the 17th century. Um, He was born around the early 1600s and he died around um, the end of the 17th century. And he did the journey that we're going to talk about around 1689. Um, And he wrote haiku. Um, haiku are 17 syllable poems, which they're like Zen moments. They sort of encapsulate a moment. Um, for example, the very famous one is Furuike ya Kawaza Tobikomu Mizunoto, which is old pond, um, a frog jumps in, sound of water, uh, which it, maybe it works in English as well, but it certainly works in Japanese. It's the, the point is the smallness of it. And it's that it's like a, it's like a flash of a flash of enlightenment. It's like a momentary flash, but they can also be funny. So he was very very famous for writing these. He is the most famous haiku poet. He mastered the art of haiku. Um, he was also a wanderer. Um, he lived on the road. He walked from place to place uh, and composed travel diaries, um, which had haiku in them. Um, and while he was traveling. He met up with groups of other poets because he was so very famous and they would compose linked verse together where he would compose a haiku um, of 17 syllables, um, which is seven, five, seven. And then um, then his um, the poets he was with would then compose a two line sort of link of two lines of seven syllables each. And then he and then the next person composes another Haiku. So there's a sort of a chain. Each one has to link to the previous one. And would they each um, also focus on the depth of a single instant? No, I think linked verse is a bit different. But there are Mm -hmm. there are rules about haiku. I mean, it's not so much that they focus on it, but just that they they're so short they're so short that you have to. It has to be about a single instant. Um, But there are rules like um, you always include a seasonal word. So you always know what t- what season it is. Um, and with Basho, there's always a kind of punchline. So if you think about old pond, okay, we, we picture the old pond and then um, a frog jumps in. So that's an event. But then the punchline is the sound of water. That's the plop when the frog jumps in. So why do you think that this became Japan's great poetic form? But maybe because one thing was that Japan was a, is a, is a society that revolves around poetry. Poetry has always been really important. Um, 
And Japanese have always, they wrote poetry before there was writing in Japan. So if you look at anthologies of poetry, I mean, they were probably passed down orally um, and then eventually they were written down. But there are, I mean, writing arrived in Japan around oh, about 500 um, AD and there were poems which, which are dated to, to way before that. Um, and in the Heian period, which was when the tale of Genji was written, which is the world's first novel and a very famous novel, um, people communicated in poetry. And the way that you would assess whether somebody was worth knowing or not was by the quality of his poetry. Um, and this was this was a very fabulous society, the Heian society. This is not well, way off the subject of Basho, but basically, um, yeah, both men and women prided themselves on the quality of their poetry. Um, and assessed everybody else on the quality of their poetry. So even if you were terribly well connected and terribly handsome and terribly noble, if your poetry was no good, then you weren't worth talking to. Um, you also had to have good calligraphy. You also had to be able to write it very nicely. So poetry has always been that sort of a thing. It's been something that everybody does. And to this day, I think everybody does it. For example, um, the emperor and the empress um, and the members of the imperial family all publish poems at the end of the year. And the early poems were more like 31 syllables. There are also longer poems, much longer poems, but they tend to be short. Um, maybe because you, you can, you can encapsulate, it's all about encapsulating a moment, isn't it? It's all about, it's maybe it's a, it's a Zen experience. Not that Zen existed way back then, but, but that sort of, that, that, that sensibility um, that feeling that that the present moment is what it's all about. It's not about sort of making some huge long thing. It's not about Wordsworth's prelude, you know, fourteen books long, blah 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 blah. It's it's like, bing, like right now. To um, set this in a more familiar context for Western listeners, yeah, uh, Basho's journey took place in what six sixteen eighty nine. Right. 1689. So this, uh, you said yeah. at, this, at this time, uh, Milton had just died uh, a few years before. Louis XIV was ruling in Versailles. Uh, Newton had just discovered gravity. And in Japan, there was peace for the first time in centuries. So what did this, why, why yeah. was that? And what did this mean for travelers? Okay. So going back to European history, I think we'd just, we'd had the, oh, we'd had the English Civil War and we just had the Great Revolution of 1688, which was when William and Mary came in from Holland and conducted a coup d'etat and took over the throne of uh, England. So that was what was going on over here. Um, in Japan, there had been war for about 200 years, um, very sort of dramatic war, and Kyoto had been burnt to the ground a few times, um, and various daimyo, who are warlords, had... Um, Basically, Japan was made up of sort of small um, kingdoms, quite a lot, maybe 240 or more than that, each of whom had its own lord, each of whom considered that to be his territory, each of whom had his own army, charged his own taxes. Um, and these warlords were continually fighting, trying to grab more territory. And finally, around the end of the previous century, about 100 years before Basho, a warlord called Oda Nobunaga, who was a great hero, um, was the first great unifier of Japan. He didn't succeed in unifying everything because he got killed off by one of his own generals. Um, but then his successor, Hideyoshi, pretty much succeeded in unifying Japan and made a great peace, which was towards the end of the 16th century, the 1500s. And when he died, he wanted his son to inherit. Um, and this is a story told in the novel Shogun mm -hmm. by James Lavelle, which has recently been on Netflix. Um, there was one great leader who was called Tokugawa Ieyasu, um, and he was supposed to be the regent while Hideyoshi's son was, in, was a child. Hideyoshi's son was five when Hideyoshi died, and his son was only five. So, um, But in the end, there was a great war between the councils of regions, and this was the final great war. And it, Tokugawa won at the Battle of Sekigahara in 1603. And he then really clamped down hard. He, he, he had to actually kill Hideyoshi's son, which didn't happen until 1615. But basically, he was very determined to ensure that there was peace. So one of the things to ensure peace, there were a lot of different ways to ensure peace, which is relevant to traveling, actually. Um, one was... It had always been that people didn't have carriages and horses. They just didn't. That wasn't how they traveled. Um, but he he sort of limited traveling. So 
basically all these daimyo still had their own provinces, but they were all under his overlordship. And between when you crossed from one province to the next, you passed through a barrier. So it's a bit like crossing from France to Germany. You had to show your passport. You had to have permits to travel. So that was one way to control travel. Um, another was that that absolutely by law could be there was no wheeled travel for people at all. So you had to walk. Or if you were a great man, you went in a palanquin, which meant you were sitting in a little wooden box, kind of jogging up and down while some blokes were carrying you on their shoulders, which is actually extremely unpleasant. You'd much better to walk. Um, uh, or you might go on horseback. Um, so that all affected travel. Um, and so the idea was to kind of limit travel. Um, another thing that happened to control the great lords was that he said, Tokugawa Ieyasu ordered that these great lords all had to go to his capital, which was Edo, um, which is now Tokyo. That was his capital. And they all had to go there and they had to be at court for about one year out of every two. So that yeah. meant that they had to have they had to have three palaces in Edo. If they were if they were rich, if they were poor, they could have one palace. But they had to have if they were rich, they had to have an upper, middle, and lower palace. And they had to, of course, had to be properly furnished, which cost a lot of money. And their women folk had to stay there all the time, and their children. So that they were almost they were sort of like hostages. Um, right. But then these the daimyo, the warlords, um, also had to have at least one palace in their own home country, which could be as far away as you know from from from. London to the to the north of Scotland or the bottom of Cornwall, a long way, um, or from or from not quite as far as from New York to LA, but nearly as far. Um, and so they had to go back and forth. So when you go back and forth, if you are a warlord, you have to travel in suitable style. So you have to be in your kind of golden palanquin, and you have to have bearers, and you have to have you know several thousand retainers, and you have to have samurai marching along, and, and any there may be women folk travelling with you. Um, so they all they're all in palanquins and ba- you have to have baggage carriers. You have to have people to carry your bath, people to carry your bath water, people to carry your food, um, cooks, uh, all sorts of people to carry your shoes. And so all along the roads, there were places where these people could stay because it's going to take a long time. So there were post towns all along the roads. Um, which had incredibly, you know, as it were, five-star places where the warlords stayed, and then lots of other places where ordinary people stayed. And you could get fresh horses there, and you could get food there, and you could get prostitutes there, because Japanese men travelling liked that sort of thing. Um, so that also affected the way that things were for travellers very much. That these, that, that, And also, you could be out on the road yourself, just an ordinary guy walking around, and Along comes a procession, you know, about 5,000 people stomping down the road. If you are a low-level guy, you get down on your knees fast, really fast, and you get your nose in the gravel and you keep it there while they go by. So basically, you don't want to meet these processions if you could possibly help it. So that also affected travelling. So you're wandering around. You might meet a huge procession. You have to have your permits. You have to show them at these barriers. The barrier guards were, of course, they were like customs officials the world over. They were nasty. They were really tough and stern and fierce. It sounds like things were much safer for travelers then, but at the same time, you said that when Basho set out, he had so little expectation of ever returning that he had sold his house in Fukugawa, just cut all his ties with home because he may never come back from this journey. Yeah. Um, no, there were still bandits. There were still bandits. The world is full of bandits. There were still bandits who might rob you along the way. Um, yeah, between, I mean, the border posts, there was huge gaps of space between the border posts. It's like crossing, you know, in and out of Germany from one to the other. There's a long way between um, where you could meet bandits. Yeah, there were bandits. But he was more concerned because he was 45, which was really old. And he felt he was an old man. And he talked about his thin shanks. He wrote a haiku about his thin thin shanks. And he also went on quite a lot about how old he was and how tired he was. Um, But there's a theory, there's a theory that Basha was actually a ninja. Mm. The distances he covered were incredibly far. So he's going on about, oh, I'm so old, I'm so tired, my legs are so skinny. But he's traveling like 50 miles a day or something. (laughs) And so, and he grew up in a place called Igoena, which is by, by Nara. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's right in the middle of Japan. Um, 
and it's it's a rather extraordinary place. Um, I I happen to adore Japanese pottery. I love Japanese pottery, and the best Japanese pottery is Iga. It's fantastic pottery. Uh-huh. If any of you people listening ever go to Japan, you should look up for Iga pottery. Um, I could tell you all about, but I I won't because it's not what we're supposed to be talking about. But Iga pottery is the best. So that's one thing. Um, and Basho was born there, and his little house is there, and you can go and see that. But it's also the headquarters of the ninja, and there's a ninja castle there. Or there was when I went there. Admittedly, when I went there was 1979, but I would bet anything that it's still there because it's a big tourist attraction. The house is still there. Like as of 20 years ago, the house is still there. The The ninja ninja house house with the trap doors and and the false ceiling panels. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, and and girls dressed as ninja with lots Mm. of sky makeup on. Yeah. So that's why that's where the sort of that 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 strange, you know, the fact that Basha was lived there and it's the ninja headquarters. You think, huh, maybe Basha was a ninja. Um, mm, so then maybe he was a spy. So maybe he was secretly spying for the shogunate. I mean, you know, as we know, all over the world, spies are always the most ordinary, boring sort of people. And so there was he a terribly respectable poet, but he could possibly he could perfectly well have been a spy. And unlike these uh the lords of uh, these different fiefdoms who traveled with massive retinues, uh, Basho makes ultralight backpackers look like pack rats. You say that he took little more than the clothes on his back, plus a paper coat to protect him uh, in the evening, a yukata, rainwear, ink, and brushes, and that's it. Well, you could buy stuff. You could buy stuff. You could buy a straw raincoat. You need a straw raincoat quite badly, which is, it, it's sort of like, it's, it's a straw raincoat. It's like a little haystack. So when you wear it, you look like a like a like a walking haystack. Um, you also need straw sandals, but I think you probably would buy a new pair just about every day because they'd wear out so fast. So there's a lot of kind of business going on. People are making and selling straw sandals. So there's a way people are making a living from the road in all sorts of different ways. Um, but yeah, he he also um, he he always stayed. He he stayed either in some little little hut. Um, there's some dispute about where he stayed because he traveled with his companion, Soda, and Soda also kept a diary. And Soda's diary is is very basic um, and has never been translated. I mean, I, I, I sort of worked my way through bits of it. And it's the reason it hasn't been translated is because it says things like, you know, May the 17th, rain, uh, walked 50 miles, had sober for supper. Um, that's it. So it's not, it's not, it's the reverse of poetic. But he does... But Soda um, isn't writing poetry. He's writing a straightforward diary. So he says things like, you know, um, "Stayed with stayed with so and so, who's you know who was a, who was a very rich man and had some lovely food," whereas Basha writes, "Oh, we had a terrible night and we stayed in this small little routine and you know hardly ate anything." And so you think, well, huh, maybe so maybe Basho is using poetic license. Also, Basho wrote his diary five years after the journey. Those sodas was written at the very time that they were that they were walking. It's really interesting. It's a bit like Graham Greene in his uh, journey without maps, traveling through um, Liberia, and then his oh, cousin yeah. also had gone with him. And her her account is very different from the account that he presents. <laughs> really interesting that this the same tradition prevails. Yeah, but also that's human. That's human life. I mean, if you look back on something that you've done quite a lot of years ago, and you think, oh, it was definitely like that, and then you meet someone that you did it with. And you discover, hmm, they have a different memory. I mean, memory is a very strange thing. So it's interesting. You, you said that Basho wanted to visit these places that had inspired the poets of the past. Many of them had written about them, but very few had visited them. People at some point had written about them, and that was why, that, why they were famous. And there's a whole tradition of, um, of place and poetry in Japan. Um, I mean, you want to, yeah. A lot of traveling in Japan to this day, probably, is to go to places that people have written poetry about and to have a look for yourself. Um, but the, but he went up north, so he went way off the beaten track. Um, and when I did that journey myself, which was actually in about, I was going to say 18 something, it wasn't, it was about 1989. It was that probably 1986 or so. Um, the book was published in 1989, the first time. So it was actually 300 years after Basho. But um, at that point, this was this is northern Japan, and this was long before Fukushima. So thanks to Fukushima, everybody knows about northern Japan. But Fukushima was not very long ago. And when I did this journey, people at, literally Japanese said to me, "Well, why do you want to go there? There's nothing there." 
um, because people tend to all go to famous places. It's indeed, we do too. We all go and have a look at the famous stuff. Whereas I discovered quite a long time ago that the non-famous stuff is much more interesting. Um, Mm -hmm. And if you looked in your Lonely Planet guidebook, when I went, it it was very, the bit about Northern Japan was very short. Um, And there were little towns where literally the person that had written Lonely Planet guidebook put nothing here, don't bother to visit. Uh, (laughs) And there was one town, there was a map. The map was like, it was like a cross. It just said, it said, there are two roads, there's nothing, nothing there. It's okay, that's it, forget it. So, so, um, so that was so, and even I would think in Basho's day, probably up north would be, would contain famous places like Matsushima, incredibly famous, where people would want to go. But it's a long way north for Meadow. So to get there, you know, you'd have to walk and walk and walk. So not that many people would actually have got there. But even so, enough people had got there that it was famous and poems had been written about it. You said it was also um, the Shirakawa barrier marks this marks this crossing point, but you said it was um, it was also a cultural barrier, a crossing point between the world of elegance, refinement, and the cultured life of Edo, and the backcountry, the rustic land of Oshu. So not just a geographical barrier, but a cultural barrier as well. Yeah, um, it's a bit like England and Scotland, I think. I mean, it's about, you know, the, the Picts and the Scots, that the ancient Romans had to build Hadrian's Wall to keep the Picts and the Scots out. So the old Japanese, back in about... Um, 700 built a line of forts across to keep out the the northern people. Um, the northern people, uh, I wrote um, that they are the Ezo, they're also known as the Emishi, um, and probably the northern people up there now is descended from the Ezo and the Emishi. Though there's, but yeah, it was quite, it took a while when the early Japanese were kind of spreading themselves out across Japan. It took quite a long time to actually conquer that northern part, and the northern part remained kind of um, barbarous in in the eyes of the southerners. Um, In those days, the capital was in Kyoto, and the capital was very kind of decadent and highfalutin and, you know, elegant and and posh and all those other things. And the people up north were considered to be sort of, you know, other and barbarous and possibly another race who knows but certainly but yeah i mean just as just like the picks and the scots are another race from the brits so we've established the context of basho when did you first come to japan and what sparked your interest in the country ah okay um well i went to japan in 1978 and um i had first of all i was a potter i love pottery and i read a book called this is the true story i read bernard leach as a potter's book Bernard Leach is really famous in Japan. He's very, fa- he's, he's, he's probably not that famous in England. He's a really wonderful potter. He lived, he's dead now. He lived, you know, in the early part of the, of the 20th century. Um, so I read a potter's book and he wrote about Japanese pottery. So that was, that was actually the, the first little kind of germ. And then I realized I was already, you know, it was the 70s. I was eating whole foods and eating miso and tofu and all those things without really thinking about where they came from. I was also into Buddhism and into Zen. Um, and then I started, uh, I decided I needed money. Um, I didn't have any money. And I decided I needed a bit of money because I wanted to buy a potter's wheel. Otherwise, I wouldn't have bothered. But I, I so I got a job teaching English um, at a language school. And one of my students was Japanese. And he, we're still friends to this day, and he asked me if I would, actually, he, he, he belongs to a quite, to an extraordinary sect, which is not Shinto or Buddhist. Um, and the Bible of this sect, he wanted to translate from Japanese into English. And he mm-hmm. wanted me to correct the English. Um, it was terrible. But anyway, he said, <laughs> he said he had no money. Oh, I hope he's not listening. Um, but uh, he said he had no money, but he said, um, he could give me Japanese lessons instead. So I thought, okay. So everything seemed to come together. Then I heard about this job that I could apply for, um, which is now, it was a man called Nicholas Wolfers, and he founded something called the Wolfers Scheme. And this was the exact first year. And they wanted to send 22 people, not to language schools, to teach English, but to ordinary schools and universities, people who were English, not American, um, and not Tokyo, but out out in the provinces. And so I applied for that job. 
This is this then this Nilt Bulfer scheme then expanded and expanded and became known as the Jet Program. Oh, very wow. very first year, and there were just twenty two. Now it's huge, as you know. Um, I applied. I went to a, for an um, an interview in the Japanese embassy. Very intimidating. And they said, if you get this job, would you like to be in Tokyo or the provinces? Uh, no, sorry. They said, would you like to be in Tokyo or the countryside? Um, and I thought, oh, countryside. I'm English. You know, I thought, oh, sheep, cows, that sounds nice. So I said, countryside. <laughs> um, these were all Japanese people that interviewed me. The word inaka means anywhere that is not Tokyo. That's what it means. So, um, so I ended up in inaka. I ended up in a very obscure um, provincial city with no other Westerners that I knew of. So I did eventually find two They're called Gifu. Um, mm-hmm. And it now has a, um, a neutrino something or other. It has, but it's, so it's become, it's, it's, it's not quite as obscure as it was, but it's still pretty obscure. Um, it was also founded by Oda Nobunaga, who was the great warlord who first unified Japan. Um, and it's, it's in the middle of Japan, and it's where the Yakuza, the mafia of East Japan, meet the Yakuza of West Japan and have shootouts. So it was quite a, it was a sort of, it was not Tokyo by any manner of means. It was a rather extraordinary place. So I ended up there and I spent two years there. And then I, um, then by then I had initially got that job because I wanted to make money and go back to India because I love India. Um, But by the end of that lot, I was sort of a bit hooked on Japan. Um, Mm. And I then did go to India for about nine months, but then I went back to Japan and spent another three years there. Then I came back to England, um, and in in that time in Japan, I did because I was living in this very traditional place, and I had no Western friends. So I did I did tea ceremony, I did flower arrangement, I did aikido, I read Japanese literature and translation, tons and tons of it. I went to the Kabuki Theater. Um, the program changes once a month, and there's always a morning show, five hours, and an afternoon show, five hours. And I would each month go and see the morning show, five hours. And then another time, go and see the afternoon show, five hours. Fantastic. Um, but to see no um, hitchhiked right up to Hokkaido, up the far north, hitchhiked down to um, Kagoshima in the far south, took the ferry over to Okinawa, um, just roamed around, roamed around by myself, and had a really wonderful time. I met loads of people, and 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 ended up able to even to understand a little bit the people up north who spoke a very different kind of dialect. And so, why did you decide to follow Basho's famous, the route of his famous journey? Well, I partly because, as I said, I've been reading lots of Japanese in translation, lots of Japanese literature in translation, um, and had read Basho and loved Basho. Basho was. Basho, apart from, there's lots of wonderful things about Basho. One of the small but wonderful things is that a haiku is only 17 syllables, so you can translate it. It's not that difficult to translate those 17 syllables. And the books that I read, the translations of the haiku were usually awful. I mean, they're like, you know, long, and whereas a haiku is short and sharp. And I started thinking, well, first of all, I'd like to see these places he writes about. And also, I could write a book, and what I could do is, sort of explain the haiku in the prose around the translation. And then I could translate the haiku almost word for word. So you'd get hopefully more of a feeling of the haiku than, than you know, these, like if you look at the Peng- Penguin book of Basho, um, that they're five lines long and they're kind of trying to get all those nuances in. Whereas I don't think that's not, that's not right. I mean, the, the Japanese language, veering slightly off the subject, is full of these wonderful words. I mean, which are just... It's just one word, and it's full of emotion, like sabishi. It's lonely. It's lonely. It's just. It's not just lonely. It's lonely. And natsukashi is ah oh, the nostalgia. It's sort of. But these they contain all this feeling, and you just have to say that word. Um, oh, like samui is. It's cold, and but there. And so that haiku work because partly because of that quality of Japanese that these words contain so much in one word. So I thought if I can somehow try and communicate some of that, maybe in my prose. And the other thing that got me going um, was this particular haiku that, for some reason, it's like Anglo-Saxon. It's natsuku seya tsuwa mono domoga. You may know at all. I'll say it again. Natsuku seya tsuwa mono domoga. You may know at all. It's natsuku seya. It's the summer grasses um, of 
forget how I translated it now, but sua mono domo gods, of strong men. You may know Atto, the aftermath of dreams. Mm-hmm. So it's just like Anglo-Saxon poetry, which I happen to love. I did English at university. I read Anglo-Saxon. And it's um, it's like, you know, all things must pass. The knight in his armor and the horse and everything else, all gone. And the Asha wrote this on the Takadachi in Hiraizumi. And he was following the footsteps of Yoshitsune, who was a fabulous hero who truly honestly lived and who was doing that journey in 1189 in the opposite direction. And I had, of course, followed the life of Yoshitsune. It colors the no plays, the kabuki plays. You, I mean, Yoshitsune is everywhere. If you go and see kabuki, there are these stories where you weep of Yoshitsune fleeing um, with his with Benke, his, his, his giant um, friend. It was like Little John to Robin Hood, um, yeah, or like like Friar Tuck, or like like yeah, like Goliath, something like that. So, so Basho went following the footsteps of Yoshitsune to the place where Yoshitsune had died, and he read these you know these stories about the great exploits of Yoshitsune. In it's also in all the epics, the great Japanese epics, um, and he got there and there was nothing there, just grasses. So he sat down and span, wept. And I thought, ah, oh, I really want to go there. So I think that was the first feeling, I want to go there. And then I thought, well, if I want to go there, then I want to go to all these other places too. Um, yeah. That was always my favorite haiku as well. Yeah, I love that one. It's amazing. Poignancy of it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And it really makes you take a closer look at your own life and your own ambitions as well. Um, so all before things. you set out, mm-hmm. before you set out, you were, um, I, I thought it was hilarious that when you said you wanted to go to Tohoku, the response was always, oh, you don't want to go there. There's nothing there. They're all yokels. Yeah. You won't understand their dialect. And anyway, it's dangerous. That, that's hilarious to me because I've spent a lot of time in this region. Um, and the other thing too, speaking of dangerous, yeah. throughout your travels, you were plagued by the usual question. You know, are, are, oh, are yeah, you alone? Yeah. Yeah. And you're, you're always met by, oh, sabishi kunai. It's, yeah. it's just people yeah. feel sorry for you for traveling alone. Maybe you could explain that for people who who haven't been on the receiving end of this question. I, see, I just read a book by Pico Aya where he is somewhere rather than, oh, he's somewhere like Iran. Um, and somebody says to him, are you all alone? And he says, I'm in a group. I'm in a group of one. And that's probably what I should have said. I'm in a group of one. Um, yeah. Um, it, it was, it's very, it's very odd to be on your own in Japan. You're supposed to be a dantai. A da, yes, dantai is a group. You're supposed to be in a group. And people do things in groups. And that's how you do things. You don't do, go do stuff on your own. Um, so it, it, people throughout my entire time in Japan would always ask me, first of all, why wasn't I married? At my age, good God. I mean, it sh- I should have been at home taking care of babies. And there I was sort of, you know, traipsing around Japan. Um, yeah, it was, it was, it, it sometimes occurred to me that it was kind of lonely. It was sort of lonely, but then it's like being single. I mean, single has its pros and its cons. It does have pros as well as cons. I mean, the, the con is that you that sometimes you get lonely, but the 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 oh, hang on, that's the yes, that's the con. But the pro is that you're incredibly free. You can do exactly as you please. And the other thing with traveling alone um, is that you meet loads of people. Everybody talks to you. Whereas if you're traveling with somebody else, you probably just talk to that one other person and that's it. So your experience of the place is going to be of that person that you're traveling with and maybe of the buildings and so on. But but not of the people. Um, so I found, yes, when I was hitchhiking alone, that was absolutely marvelous. I met all sorts of people and they would always say, this is Japan. Japan is terribly safe. So as you know, Japan and people would say, well, come home to my place tonight. So I'd go back to their place and they'd, give, they'd put me up for the night. And and then you have really long, interesting conversations. And that wouldn't probably happen if you were not alone. Everybody was very perturbed. They all thought, um, I think they... The fact I was foreign meant I was definitely odd anyway, because foreigners are kind of odd. And then I was also vegetarian. That's also odd. Um, and so the fact I was alone was was no more odd than an, all those other oddnesses. I was just generally odd. But they were. Ve- but everybody was also very protective and nice to me. I don't know if they would have been if if they would be equally nice to a man. Maybe they would. Maybe they wouldn't. I don't know. But they were very. Everybody was so always incredibly kind to me and incredibly protective. 
So I wanted to focus on on three of the places you visited on mm-hmm. your journey um, to give listeners a sense of, of what's in store for them when they read your book. Uh, two two are places that I know fairly well, and and the other somewhere that I've always wanted to go. So first, um, Hiraizumi, you, which you mentioned before, could you could you tell us some? Um, you always, you already told us why Basho went there, but why is Hiraizumi significant? Why was the why did this northern outpost of culture um, oh. happen there of all places? Ah. Oh. Um. So first of all, Hiraizumi. Hiraizumi was the capital city of the Ezo in the north. And it was the city of gold. And Marco Polo never went there, but he wrote about it. He read, he heard in China that there was a city where the palaces were roofed with gold and walled with gold. Um, He's not quite right. There were temples because it's much more religious culture than he was aware of. Um, But it was... Um, It was the capital of the Fujiwara lords, and it was the only part of Japan at that point that was not under the control of the then shogun, whose name was Yoritomo, who was the brother of Yoshitsune. So Yoritomo was the sort of wicked brother, if you like, just to make it very, very simplistic here. And so when Yoshitsune fled, he fled north to Hiraizumi. Um, and this was a whole sort of center of culture in those days. And um, it was said to be more magnificent than Kyoto. And, of course, much more magnificent than Kamakura, which was the capital of the bad brother, Yoritomo, um, which was a kind of military base. I mean, Yoritomo, this was, he was the first kind of military lord. He, he, had, he, had, he had defeated the, the, the people, the gorgeous Heian civilization had been kind of overthrown by the samurai and Yoritomo was the first kind of samurai lord so where he lived in Kamakura was a kind of military base Hidaizumi was something very different and for about a hundred years it was it was an independent it was the capital of an independent kingdom and I think I think they had gold mines I think there were gold mines and that's where they got the gold from Um, and there is still you can still see or you could when I went um, the golden temple which is very little. It's very surprisingly little, um, but very exquisite. And um, it's sort of encased in another building to protect it from the elements. So it's quite odd. You can't, you, it's not there glowing, but you you enter this other building and then there is this beautiful, beautiful golden temple. So Basho was very keen to go there, not particularly because of the temple of gold, I don't think, but because it's where Yoshitsune met his end. And that makes it an incredibly kind of romantic and heroic place. Um, so Yoshitsune fled in the opposite direction from the journey that Basho took. And he went up the Japan sea coast, and then he came in along the Mogami River, fleeing from Yoritomo, his bad brother. So Yoshitsune had won stupendous, unbelievable victories on behalf of his brother. He had defeated his brother's enemy, who were the Taira or the Heike. Um, and you know, won these stupendous victories where he'd done things like gallop straight down a cliff with his men to attack the Tyro who were camped at the bottom and were completely taken by surprise. Um, And then basically there was a a naval battle where he just completely wiped out the Tyro who jumped into the water carrying the emperor who was two years old um, and they all, they drowned, not all of them drowned, but they drowned and there are crabs on the beach which have samurai heads on their shells, which are said to be the souls of those drowned Taira. Anyway, that was what Yoshi, that was Yoshitsune. Was a, so he was a fantastic hero, but his brother was then jealous of him and was afraid he wanted to take over. So he then fled north. Mm-hmm. And he fled to Hidaizumi because he'd been there when he was young and he knew the lords there and the lords gave him sanctuary. And when he got there, there were he had something like nine followers. And the old lord who gave him sanctuary died. And the, he, the old lord told his son to continue giving Yoshitsune sanctuary. And um, the young son was very afraid of Yoritomo. So he decided he would help out Yoritomo. So he sent his army, 20,000 men, against Yoshitsune. So Yoshitsune was in his own small castle, which the old lord had built for him, above the Koromo River, with Benke, his giant sort of sidekick plus his nine followers, um, and they were surrounded by this enormous, enormous army. And, of course, Yoshitsune's followers were much better soldiers than that 20,000-strong army, so they were managed, they met, were able to hold the army at bay. Um, and 
the whole they were holding the army at bay so that in as a good samurai so that Yoshitsune could commit honorable suicide which he did we think there's more I'll tell you the other bit of that in a minute but um so in the end all those other followers were dead except Benke and Benke was something like 10 foot tall and he was standing there completely covered in arrows where he'd been shot by the attacking army um it's like a porcupine and but just standing there and they were so afraid of him this huge army that they didn't dare pass him to go and bother Yoshitsune who was busy committing suicide um and then one horse one horseman really took a deep breath braver than all the others and galloped a little bit closer and the wind of his horse caused Benke to kind of topple and of course Benke was dead he was just standing there dead and he'd been dead for quite a long time but with all these arrows so he'd held off his army while dead meantime Yoshitsune probably committed suicide and Probably his wife and his children were also were killed by his retainers, which is the proper thing to do, and were and the whole castle was burnt. Um, and so Basho wanted to see the place where this had happened, and that was where he wrote this wonderful haiku about summer grasses, nothing left of all these deeds of these great warriors. This is all. Um, and so I went there too, and I could, I'm picturing it in my mind right now. I mean, I, I remember looking out over the plain and seeing the winding river Koromo, and thinking, wow, this is actually Benke was standing right there. And there is a little temple there, which um, we, where there's a sort of image of Yoshitsune. Um, and, but the end, the other part of the story is that, there's, that there was this other theory that actually Yoshitsune escaped and went north. And there are all sorts of, you know, sort of folk memories of him passing through and then that he snuck over and went over to Mongolia and became Genghis Khan. <laughs> And then got his revenge two generations down the line when Kublai Khan tried to attack Japan. But that's another story. That's it's quite an incredible that's, place. Is if anyone's in that uh, region and yeah. is considering visiting, my wife, my wife's hometown is a ten minutes by car away from Hiraizumi, so I've really? you know, been there yeah. many times. And uh, oh, so you know it. I was just there last year. The um, in the uh, Chusanji. It's uh, still there, is it? The Chusanji. Yes, yeah. Well, her brother. Oh. Um, he has a company that does electrical lighting and they did the lighting for Chisanji. Oh, wow. So wow. we had, wow. we had the tour of it again last year to see this new, you know, the oh, new lighting okay. and how spectacular wow. it looks. So yeah, it's quite a beautiful place. I'd love to go back there actually, I must say. Yeah. I haven't been, I haven't been, I've been back to the villages that I write about. I used to go back quite regularly, but I haven't been back to Hiraizumi. Yeah, this is really, it's really interesting. Another place too, I'd like to um, ask you about that you mentioned briefly is mm. Yamadera. Basho made a significant detour off his route to see this place. And you write that uh, the entire mountain is an enormous temple. So could, could you describe that for us? Um, it's kind of rocky. Um, and there's little, basically, I mean, all of Japan is a temple, if you like. I mean, so every natural place is a temple. Um, and it's marked with, I mean, small temples where you can pray to the gods, um, small temples, small holy places, small Jizo summer, which are little images. Um, and you, I mean, people go there with the with some of the ashes of their ancestors to leave them there. And then right up on the kind of topmost pinnacle um, in a very kind of vertiginous place, you can't imagine how it got there. There is, so there's, there, there is an, another sort of roofed temple. So it's quite tough to climb up there. Um, but you, you're passing all the time these different places where people will stop um, and will maybe lay a stone, maybe say a prayer, um, just to to pay respects to the god of the mountain. I mean, basically, Shinto is about you know that ev everywhere everywhere is divine, um, and, and, but but some places just have this kind of numinous quality. And Yamadera, I guess, kind of stands up out of the plain. It's just, it's there, you're, you're, you're on this flat plane, and then you see it kind of rising up, um, rather as Fuji does, actually. Fuji, too, kind of mm -hmm. rises out of the plane. But Yamadera is sort of rocky, um, and these places, by, by definition, are kind of spiritual sites, I guess. Um, it's, yeah, to call it Shinto is a, is a bit kind of, it's a bit Western. It's, it's sort of putting a name to something that doesn't really have a name. It's more just, these are holy places. And of course, there's, there are there are Tory gates. So you step through these gates, which indicate that now you're stepping onto sacred ground. Yeah, it's an incredible location. It's it's really um, it's everything you imagine when you think of a mountain temple clustered on the side of a crag, you know, wreathed in mist. Um, 
but and you had the place to yourself you said when you hiked up it was the same for me i was there last year and we were there so early in the morning because my brother-in-law you know took us on to to see this place and always at the crack of dawn so just there was nobody around by the time we by the time we came back down you started to see a trickle of people and the usual bus tours and stuff coming but but uh, for that you know brief hour or two that we had this magical place to ourselves it's it's a really incredible incredible spot yeah it is amazing but also the way that it kind of rises out of the plane is Mm. very extraordinary i think and you see i mean when i was coming down there were people carrying these kind of sticks with sanskrit written on them um, which they're going to place with the the ashes of, of some of the ashes of their ancestors. I mean, this is something Westerners don't quite grasp that you can you can have some ashes here and some other ashes here. So you can keep some ashes at home and then you can pray to them and then take other ashes to Yamadera. So they're in a particularly mm-hmm. holy place. So tell me about some of the the people that you met in Tohoku. Like at one point, you say. Um, I listened in trance to their tales of bear hunting and eating bear meat, of silkworm keeping, the rice harvest, the winter snows, boars rooting up the rice shoots, plagues of rabbits in the bean fields. Uh, here among these old people, I was in a world that Basho would have recognized. Yeah. Um, so the moment was when I, I saw this. I'd been kind of traveling and I guess on the road and, and meeting lots of wonderful people, but sort of moving on, moving on. And then I saw this little path winding away sort of through the trees. And I really wanted to find somewhere that felt like Basho's path, which meant getting off the road, because where Basho walked was, of course, the main highway. So now the main highway is a road. So I I had to leave Basho's path. And I went along this little tiny kind of overgrown path, which in these days, alas, is now a road, I'm, I'm afraid, and has a bus on it. But But in those days, it didn't. It was a kind of miserable little footpath. And I came to the top of the hill and looked down and saw this absolutely extraordinarily beautiful little village um, and with sort of paddy fields spread out to the mountains and, you know, the sort of brilliant green of the paddy fields. And these houses, which were, uh, first of all, I saw thatch. And then later on, I began to realise that most of the houses that had a beautiful thatched roof had, alas, corrugated iron walls. And um, most of the houses that had beautiful wooden walls had kind of red or blue tiled roofs. So there weren't many... You know, I mean, there weren't many houses that were actually old all over. Um, and I and I ended up in those days, I was time rich and money poor. Um, and I ended up staying for quite a long time with this particular woman um, in who was. Hmm, I actually don't know how old she would have been, but she was she was a granny. So No, she wasn't a granny. That was the whole point. But she had a son and she had a daughter in law who was who had failed to have a child as yet. So she was that sort of age. So she must have been about 50. Um and I would just hang around in the village, first of all, trying to get to grips with um, the people's dialect, which was quite hard. I had to kind of learn how to translate the kind of um, sound changes in my mind um, right. and and just go and sit in people's houses. And they would tell me stories. Um, and they did talk about about Matagi, about the bear hunters and how one time they'd had they'd found, you know, these Matagi had brought bear meat and they'd all you know, been desperate to have some and not everybody got it because there wasn't that much bear meat. But, you know, this was a sort of special delicacy. Um, and another time, um, the one of the one of the cousins of this woman that I was staying with um, took me out mushroom hunting. Um, and so we went sort of into the woods and dug around and found all sorts of mushrooms. And she obviously had an eye for it. I didn't have an eye for it, but she'd say, look under those leaves there. And then she'd sort of pull out the mushrooms. Um, and... Basically, these people lived in that village. They didn't, the, 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 the woman, to call her a woman sounds kind of cold. I, I mean, she was Okasa and she was mother and she was very motherly. Um, and she, most of them had never been very far from the village and she had never been to Tokyo. She was too busy. Um, outside this lovely house she had, there was, um, there was a kind of trout, st- a stream with trout in it. Um, and there were also her paddy fields. Uh, and um, it was it was incredibly noisy. I remember it was so blooming noisy. There were like bullfrogs honking and there was water rushing and there were, you know, there was just this noise of kind of natural noises, but it was noisy. You think, oh, that's going to be quiet. It wasn't quiet. Um, and um, she would she would produce very nice meals for me of of sort of kind of wild vegetables and rice and miso soup um, and probably natto. Um, 
And I actually went, once I'd finished writing the book, I went back several times to see them. I really liked them. Uh, they were lovely. Um, and her cousin, who had who has a young son, who I probably who I wrote about in my book, is Toshi. Called, I think I called him Toshi Yuki. His name is Toshi Masa. I changed people's names. I was very worried they might be embarrassed. Um, but I, when, when I went back to see her um, and she asked, what was it she... Um, when, when, that's right. When, when I left, she said, where was I going? And I thought, well, if I say England, she'll think I'm completely like a sort of space creature, you know, a thing from outer space. It's too alien. So I said Tokyo. And that wasn't true. Actually, I went home. I came back to England. And when I went back to see her, she wasn't fooled. She said, oh, I've been watching the TV. She said, I want to make sure that everything's all right over there in England. Um, you've got that Mrs. Thatcher, haven't you? And I thought, good grief. <laughs> How dare I assume that she's so uninformed? She's actually perfectly well informed. Um, but I think the first time I ever went, um, the first the question they all asked me, it was nothing about Tokyo or England or anything else. The first question they always said was, how's the harvest on the other side of the mountains? Or what's the weather like on the other side of the mountains? So their idea of, of, of abroad almost was the other side of the mountains. So that's, that's an indication of how cut off they were in these in these valleys. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then um, at one point I was in Tokyo. Uh, this is some years later, not that many years later. And my I was somewhere. I always told them when I was in Tokyo. And my phone rang. I had a, you know this. I had my phone rang, and um, this voice said, "Nizuki San." And I thought, "Uh oh, I know who that is." It was Toshi Toshi. It was Toshi Masa. He was he's the sort of spokesman. He's he's this young ebullient bu- bloke who had a shoe factory. Um, and he said, "Nizuki San." He said, there's a house for sale. Do you want to buy it? Um, and I thought, whoa. Um, so he, he, I said, OK, well, I'll come. I said, after some conversation, I said, OK, I'd go and have a look. So I went went up. And um, by then, you could actually, I think the first time I'd, of course, the first time I'd gone, I'd, I'd gone on small local trains and I'd walked. But the other times I went, I went on the Shinkansen, on the bullet train, as close as you could get. And then I took a local train and I finally got off the local train. I think it would have been Oishida, the bus stop. And there were, I got off the local train. There were several bus stops. And um, one of the bus stops was just, you can notice that the people at this particular bus stop were shorter than all the other people. It was really notable. And that was my bus stop. So I went to the bus stop where everybody was shorter. And that was the one that went off to the village. Everybody, I, I mean, I am five foot five and I was a complete giant. People went on about how huge I was. Um, so I went and I and I had a look at this house and it was the equivalent. It was about two. I, I forget what it was in the end. It was two thousand pounds in English money. And but I I that, that I still didn't have much money. I, I mean, these days things aren't that hard. But in those days, I still didn't have much money. And whatever money I had, I actually I wanted to buy a laptop rather badly. So <laughs> um, I could have I could have bought it just about for two thousand pounds. But in the village, there is you have a road and then you have a river and the houses above the road are nice and dry and the road the houses below below the road by the river are quite damp and this house was by the river it belonged to an old old lady and she had died and her family had gone to Tokyo they'd all gone and they didn't want the house and they didn't care what happened and the villagers really wanted to preserve that house because it was an old house and they tried to persuade me. They said, look, you know, we'll take care of it for you. When you're not here, we'll sweep the snow off the roof. Um, they said, they said, um, they said, the, the, the toilet is rather primitive. And I thought, huh, if you've seen their toilets and they think the toilet's primitive, it must be really primitive. And it was indeed very primitive. It was a sort of shed outside um, with a hole in the ground. And um, it was a sort of car. It had a, um, it was a sort of, corrugated iron walls and a thatched roof I think um anyway I spoke to a friend of mine in Tokyo who's a Japanese friend and he said well you know it would cost you 30,000 pounds to have it fixed up probably um and basically I might have had the 2,000 but I certainly didn't have 30,000 so I didn't but that was sad uh, that was really sad but it was very nice it was always wonderful to see them they were really wonderful um I also went back a couple of times and made tv programs up there I did one for Channel 4. I went, that was in 91. So I went back and saw them all again. Um, and then I went back and did a programme for NHK, which would have been the mid-90s, and saw them all again. 
So I saw them again and again. At this point, we've lost touch. Um, part, mainly, I think, because they because I got lazy and I got busy and I did other things in my life and went to other countries. And also because that whenever I, I used to send them postcards, but my written Japanese is not so great. So it was really hard work for me to write to them in Japanese. I would do it, but it took a long time. Um, and so that that's when that's why I say I got lazy that I just to write a postcard in Japanese was quite was too big a job. So so we sort of lost touch. But I could actually there was a point when a prime minister called Takeshita, I think, um, promised to give something like a hundred thousand or was it a million yen to each village in the entire country. And I I, I heard that the people in Shimokoya in that village just sort of used that money to dig for hot water and found hot water. So they probably they probably turned themselves into a hot spring resort. So maybe if I'd bought that house, I would now be <laughs> rolling in money. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the owner of a hot spring. Um, yeah. I thought it was interesting too, how the villages that you traveled through in that area kind of forecast some of the problems that we see in Japan today. Like you, you said that there were um, 200 unmarried farmers in one of those villages. And unless they found wives quickly, the whole village would just die out. So at, at, at one point, 10 of them started looking abroad for wives and went um, to the Philippines where there were a village of un unmarried girls who also needed husbands. <laughs> and they ended up coming back. I, I hear stories like this quite often still in Japan of these um, yeah. farmers who, who can't find a wife and they go, the Philippines seems to be quite a popular place for that. Yeah, but I've heard, I heard also, I don't know, it must have been when I went back, you know, in all those different times that I heard that it hadn't really worked out with the Filipino girls because Filipinos, Filipinos are very joyous and they love singing and dancing and they like discos and that sort of thing. And that's not the sort of thing you get in a Japanese farming village. <laughs> and quite a lot of them got bored. They got bored. And also they didn't speak Japanese, so they would have to buckle down and learn Japanese. So I think I didn't particularly work. I would actually love to go back and see how things are now. And I could almost certainly find Toshimasa, the young man with the shoe factory. The older generation um, have probably died out. But the young um, daughter-in-law of Okasan, who couldn't have a child, had a child. So when I went back, I met him. He was called Yoshi. And he, when I went back in probably maybe the early 90s, he was a baby. So he must now be, what, 34, 35 Maybe he's maybe he's in Tokyo. Who knows? But maybe he's not. Maybe he's up there. Um, I mean, Toshimasa, this the young the young lad that I write about in my book, had found a way of staying in in the area and and making a living and also giving employment to lots of people. So I think I think the, I think they're they're quite proud of where they live and they they're happy to be who they are. Um, and some get driven to Tokyo. And I think lots of those homeless people that you see in Tokyo these days are Tohoku guys looking for work. Um, but I think if they possibly can, I think people would rather stay up north. It's certainly different, a different life there than Tokyo. But it seems like so many of the younger people end up, like, like anywhere, end up getting driven to the larger cities and these small towns just keep shrinking and shrinking. I mean, it was like that where I came from. And, and I see the same thing um, in Iwate when I go back there. Yeah, I mean, it's a bit like just thinking back to the host, to the the women and children who were the who were the women and children of the warlords of the daimyo who had to who had to live in to, in Edo all the time, um, and that meant that they were growing up in the in the in the metropolis. So these people, they were all completely citified. So although you, people say they were hostages, well, they weren't really. They were hostages in the sense that they couldn't leave. But it's like being host, being forced to stay in London or forced to stay in Berlin and not able to go to John O'Groats. I mean, you'd probably actually rather be in London anyway. Um, so it was a similar situation there that, that again, you know, so probably the bright lights of the big city attract people, don't they? I mean, the people from up north, the young people would like to get to Tokyo and have some glamorous job. Um, or just, just make a living. They'd probably like to make a living, and it's easier to make a living if you go to the big city. Um, the, so there's one last place I wanted to ask you about while I still yeah. have you here. It's a place I've long wanted to visit, um, Dewa Sanzan. Could you uh -huh. tell us um, what the name refers to, first of all, and, and what was it like to go there? Wow. So there were two northern countries. As I said, they, these were the daimyo's countries, so we called all these different countries. To this day, they're called countries. Um, and Dewa was the was the Japan seaside. It was a huge, long country. Um, so the Dewa, the Dewa Sanzan, the Dewa is the name of the 
of the country, of the area. And Sanzan means the three mountains. That's the three sacred mountains of Dewa. Um, it was very extraordinary to go there. It was very extraordinary. I went back quite a lot of times. It's absolutely wonderful. Um, so you start off, the first one is called Hagarosan. And um, it's which means black wings. And you go through a torii gate at the bottom of the mountain. And then um, you go past um, you go past a pagoda. And you go past a waterfall, you go over a red bridge, and then there are steps. And there are steps and steps and steps. I've forgotten how many, but there is a specific number of steps, 200 and something steps. They're stone steps. And you go up these steps, up and up, up and up, up and up. And up at the top, um, there are a load of really amazing temples, huge temples, both, you know, Shinto, what we call shrines, but, but basically they look like temples. They've got enormous kind of thatched roofs. Um, and they do in in Jan in um, December. They have a fire ceremony there. They have an enormous fire ceremony, um, and they have a huge bonfire, and they have sort of dragons, and they have people people carried on enormous logs, um, riding enormous logs, um, and they have a, a huge kind of holy rope that gets gets thrown to the crowd. Um, so this is this is a really holy place, Hagarosan. Um, and it was founded by Hachiko, who had the head of a bee um, and who followed a three-legged crow until he was taken to this holy place. And there are also people there who mummify themselves. And you can see the mummy. Um, if you wanted to mummify yourself, you do. You eat basically nuts. Um, and that somehow preserves your body and your flesh sort of drops away and you become, you shrink. The idea is to become a Buddha in this lifetime without dying. So the theory is that you you remain alive and eventually they put you into a little hole and they put a straw in your mouth. Um, and then when you stop breathing, then they open up the hole and they put they, they then enshrine you. So you can go and see these mummies. So there's all sorts of there's a lot of very interesting religious stuff going on. And you can also um, do various kind of what's the word, various practices, various disciplines. You can do fire practice. And there are Yamabushi. Who are mountain priests who um, walk around the mountains and who lead people doing these practices. One of the famous practices is standing under a waterfall, um, freezing cold waterfall. And so it's a kind of purification thing, but it's also leading you to a form of enlightenment. So that's Hagarasan. Hagarasan is kind of accessible, I suppose. And it's it's this kind of temple place. And you can go to the top on a bus. You don't have to walk up all those steps. Um, the next one is Gassan, and Gassan means moon mountain. And you can walk there from Hagarosan, um, or you can take a bus to a, a point quite low down, and then, then you have to walk, then there's, there's no alternative. And you walk across kind of marshland. And I did this journey with pilgrims. So you wear a special kind of religious um, mulberry leaf knotted string around your neck. Um, and you climb, it's, it's a long walk. I mean, it goes on and on and you get probably, you leave very early in the morning and you get up to the top of Gassam where there's just a very small shrine and you have your little packed lunch up there. Um, and then you go down the other side and you know I'm not going to tell you what the final mountain is like because you're not allowed to, but the last mountain is called Yudono, which means it's like, uh, it means hot water, Um sacred hot water i guess and from the top of gasan you go down you go down some kind of rusty ladders and then you come to the entrance to the place where you're on you don't know now this is the holy place the holy of holies it's the holy of holies um and there is the tory gate to mark the entrance um and there there you 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 have water to wash your hands and then you step through this entrance and you see goshintai you see the body of the god but Basho said, basically, you may not say what you may not say what you saw. People do say, I've seen it written online. It really annoys me. It annoys me very much, but but I'm not going to say. Um, so Basho said, at this point, I laid down my brush. And I also laid down my pen when I wrote about it. And when we made the TV programs, we got as far as that entry place. And I went inside, but the camera did not. So okay. there you do see this very sacred thing. You see the God, you see the God. Very amazing. Um, and so that is the kind of, as the Holy of Holies, it's the, it's the, it's the grand finale 
of the three sacred mountains. Um, and and yeah, that's that. That's that's the three sacred mountains. But the, the, it's worth seeing, and I think it's worth seeing properly, and it's worth seeing not on a bus. It's worth going actually walking up Hagarosan and then going walking up Gassan and walking down and then seeing for yourself what is the body of the god. You, a vision like that has to be earned, I think. You you have to go on foot. Yeah, I mean there are lots of Japanese that go do lots of that do things in buses these days. I mean they also want to, but they have a different approach. I mean they want to see it. They want to see it. They don't want to not see it. So even if they're really old and infirm, they're going to see it. Um, and they go, you know, they they go all over the place in buses and they see things. Um, this is this is yeah. But I think um, you also it it helps if you know Japan and if you spent time in Japan and if you if you can sense if you can sense the the sort of numinous quality of these holy places it's not sightseeing it's not like going to see the Colosseum. it's sort of it's it's not sightseeing it's often with with japanese famous places it's not it's not it's not something obvious i mean if if a tourist just goes and you're looking at a wall that's not much but you have to kind of understand what's going on and also that the mountains themselves are holy i mean once upon a time women were not allowed to climb the holy mountains because the the mountains are women and they're jealous so only men could climb. So there's one um, Kumano, which is a very fa- very famous holy mm-hmm. mountain, um, not that long ago became open to women. Um, so the idea of hiking, the idea of hiking is not right. I mean, you have to go as a pilgrim. And it's mm-hmm. that one, it is quite good to go, I think, with a group, to go with a group of pilgrims. It's quite That's quite wonderful. Um, mm-hmm. Who all have their own different kind of motivations and reasons for being there and also different things that they get out of it. So are there still true Yamabushi? Living in Japan today? Um, well, what do you mean by true Yamabushi? Still, still I mean, I, following the older ways? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think it's like, yes, I've seen Yamabushi. I haven't been up north recently, but I saw Yamabushi in, in, in Kyoto. Um, but it's sort of like, what do you mean by true Yamabushi? Because, you, I mean, it's it's a different, It's a, I, I was thinking today, I was thinking the Western way is very kind of binary. It's like either you're this or you're that, but you can't be both. So, I mean, it, it, a sort of silly example, but you know, it's not a silly. It's a good example. Either you're straight or you're gay. Whereas in Japan, you don't have to. You don't have to lay down the law like that. I mean, you can play tennis and you can also play cricket. They're not mutually exclusive. And similarly, I mean, the people I met were also farmers. You just change your clothes, but that doesn't that doesn't make you any less of a yamabushi. I mean, here, I think, you know, you have to say, oh, I'm a priest, and you put on your priest robes, and you're 100% priest all the time. But in Thailand, for example, I mean, lots and lots of kids can go off and become monks for six months or a year or two years or three years, and then go back to being, you know, um, secular people again. And similarly, the guys that I saw in their Yamabushi robes in Kyoto, they probably had other other things they did in their lives. They weren't only Yamabushi, but that doesn't mean they were any less Yamabushi. They were Yamabushi. It's it's the um, connection to the lineage, I think, the the tradition, this long stretched back tradition. Yeah. But I think if but you can go yes, but I mean you can go up to Hagarasan and you can practice all those austerities. A lot of people do that. I mean, there's a, there was a long house that I saw on Hagar Sun where you go in and apparently, it, you know, they, they burn fires in there till it's incredibly hot and you kind of inhale the smoke and, and then you go and you walk around the mountains for a certain number of days. I mean, but these, these instructions are passed down and they're passed yeah. down. Um, and similarly, it's, yeah, um, people ask that about the geisha. You know, are there real geisha? And, I mean, I've, know, I've met lots of geisha who who I've met them, you know, when they're off duty and they've got short hair, they've got their hair in rollers and they're wearing Western clothes. So that doesn't mean they're not geisha. It just means they're not wearing the kit. But just because you're not wearing the kit doesn't mean that you're not a real whatever it is. One of the the interesting observations that came up in your book again and again that I thought was intriguing, uh, you you often would ask somebody um, the why of something. Why do they do things this way? Or And uh, mm-hmm. they could easily tell you, what they do, the practices, but they could, why was something they didn't seem to think about? Why do you think that was, to put the same question to you? When you learn something in Japan, um, it's like I learned pottery here. And very early on, you get um, in England, you know, here's your piece of clay. Okay, now you can express yourself, start expressing yourself, be creative. Um, When you do pottery in Japan, which I've also done, um, 
what you're supposed to do first, is, I didn't do this, but you're supposed to spend about a year living with the master. You just live with the master. And you don't ask him. You never, ever ask him anything, ever. Never, never. You just live with him. And you clean the floor and he shouts at you. Um, and then you might get a, you might be then able to knead the clay in this way, not some other way, but this way. And you don't ask why, you just do it. Um, and then you might be able to make, a, maybe make a very, very small bowl. Um, and then when you can make a hundred identical, exactly identical to his very, very stern eye, identical small bowls, then you might go on to making very small saucers and so, but you never ask why, you never ask why. I did Zen. You never ask why. Why do we have to sit like this? Why are my knees killing me? Um, I don't know. I, I tend to agree. It's a silly question. I, I did Aikido. That's right. I did Aikido as well. Um, and I sort of assumed that there'd be, you know, I'd have special lessons because I was a beginner. No, I get put in with somebody um, who's, a, who's very advanced and I'm standing there opposite him and I put my hand out. And the next thing I know, he grabbed my hand. I've done a somersault in the air and I'm standing on my feet again. Oh. And sort of, you know, thinking, good grief, what happened? But, but there's no, I, I can, I, I can, I don't know. Maybe, maybe when you ask me why, I can't answer because I'm not used to being asked why anymore. I mean, the way that Japan works is that there is a way that you do it. You do it like this. And if you do it like this, that's good. And if you start messing around and trying to do it some other way, then it's not going to work. And the, the, and the way that, the way that you do it has been honed. You know, you were talking about lineage. It's been honed down the generations for a really long time. And that's the way it's, it's going to work. And if you are going to be a grand master potter and express yourself through pottery, you will have already done that 10 years training. Same thing with making sushi. You spend your first year, you know, sweeping the floor. And then you might get to kind of probably wash the rice. And then you might get to even boil the rice and so on. But I mean, basically, but when you've done that, you can really do it. You can do it properly. You can do it properly. Whereas if you start, if you do it the Western way, oh, let's have a bash. If you sort of have a go, you know, um, then it's, it's, it's basically, it's not going to work. It's, it's, a, it's a very perfectionist culture, which I like very much. I think it's great. If you're going to do something at all, if you're going to be a road sweeper, in England, if you're a road sweeper, you'll probably, you probably have a chip on your shoulder. Why am I just a road sweeper? But in Japan, you're going to get that road really clean. I mean, that is going to be the cleanest road in the whole of Japan. So I, I, there's not quite an answer, but it's sort of an answer. Well, it's in when you said to, you mentioned Aikido and martial art, that's, it struck me that this way of doing things is, is very similar to haiku in a sense, that it's revelatory. Yeah. You know, like when you're, when you're studying a martial art or something like this, by being thrown so many times over and over again, you just... It's trans the, the knowledge is transmitted through the doing of it and the experiencing of it in that same way. And it's you have that moment of revelation. But also uh, Western, in the in the physical. Yeah. I mean, Western culture is is so cerebral. You know, your conscious gets in the way the whole time. You know, every time you ask why, it's your conscious working away. Whereas everything in Japan, not everything in Japan, but a lot of stuff in Japan is more kind of Zen-like, isn't it? You don't I mean, I remember going to see my Zen master once. And, and I was sort of going, blah, blah, blah. And he said, you're thinking. He said, you didn't come here to think. Um, and that's right. That's that's the way that the Japanese traditional stuff works. It's not about got to work it out. There's got to, you know, there's got to be a why, 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 why. Thinking, 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 thinking. Um, so, yeah, even, I mean, doing yoga. I do yoga and I try and quiet my mind down. I'm always trying to get this blooming mind to stop, you know, babbling on in my head if I possibly can I think but I think that asking why is the babbling that's the babbling that's right that that's the very simple answer isn't it that you you want to stop that that babbling I mean the second you start asking why then your head sets off trying to work it all out and and when you've got it with your head the rest of you hasn't got it at all whereas <laughs> when, when you can make a you know when you make a pop with your hands your hands have got it you don't you don't need to know why you just have to do it yeah, so that, that the nature of direct transmission, it seems. Yeah. 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 yeah that's very interesting. So my last question. Um, <laughs> yeah. You said that you went back to Tohoku many times to see these same friends. That the kind of the end result of your journey was this uh this series of return journeys. Um, what was it about that region that kept drawing you back? Oh. The deep north that Basho wrote about. Yeah. Well, it was partly, of course, just those people. I wanted to see those people. Um, also that it was it's so beautiful. It's so beautiful and it's so unspoilt. Um, and it's also kind of 
spacious and unspoiled. It's not just one little unspoiled place, it's lots of unspoiled places. Um, when I've I've since done then done you know lots of writing about other aspects of Japan and I've I learned more about the history of the North um, and what happened to the North um, at the so-called Meiji Restoration, which ought to be called the Meiji Revolution, when there was but there was a lot of um fighting between the northern people who supported the shogun um, and the southerners who had actually taken over the government at that point in the name of the emperor. And finally, Aizu, which is very near Yamadera, um, was besieged by forces. This was in 1868 um, for several months. And the people of Aizu were just fighting, fighting um, to, to defend themselves. So this was basically the last stand of the followers of the shogun was Aizu. Which is which is in the center of um, the north, and finally the castle was taken. Um, a lot of people had been killed. Um, women came out to fight in sort of you know platoons of a, a platoon of women, um, and the people of Aizu were either taken down to Edo, which was then Tokyo by now, as prisoners of war, or they were taken up north to the salt lands on the way to Osolizan, way up north, which is unfertile soil so that you, you die because you can't grow things. It's salted, salty soil. Um, and Isa no longer exists. Isa was a major, co- it was a country. There is no Isa. It's now called Fukushima. It's called Fukushima. Um, and, and, and because the whole of that north had supported the shogun, this is one reason why to this day, it's, it's still the poorest part of the country. Because the people that took over Japan were from the, from the southwest. They were from Satsuma. They were from Choshu, which is you know the, the sort of south, southwest part of the country. So that's another reason why this particular part of the country is kind of um, yes, is, 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 suffers a bit. Suffers a bit. It's a bit. It's poorer than the rest of the country. Um, and when people think of up north, they think of you know they think well. If you think of who are these homeless people that you see in Tokyo, these are probably from up north. They're probably not. So actually, we have the same thing over here, that our north is is rather, you know, in worse shape than the south as well. That's also what attracts me to it. It's uh, seldom traveled compared to the other the other yeah. parts of Japan. So there's just so much to discover there, it seems. Yeah, there's lots of wonderful places up there. I mean, there's Tono, which has the stories of Tono around it. Um, there are Kappa, who are these kind of, you know, these, these, these frog-like creatures that will pull your horse into the water. Um, and when you meet one, you have to remember that he has a saucer on his head. It's, it's he's like they look like frogs, and they've got rather long legs, and they're green, and they're quite naughty. But on their heads, they have a saucer of water, which is their energy. So what you do is you bow, and then they bow back because they're very polite. And then the water comes out. Then they have no energy, mm-hmm. and then you can carry on your way. So there's they're they're up there. Then there's Sugaru that that Dazai Osamu wrote about. Yes, which yes. I went to a long time ago, actually. And Osolezan, which I haven't been to for a really long time. And it was absolutely amazing. This is this is the terrible mountain up at the very top of Honshu. Um and when I went up there on my own, of course, and and uh this would have been in the 80s that I went. Um and you know you just slept on the temple floor. It was a great big temple, and it's, it's like one person, one mat. You get you well, probably more squashed than that. Probably one person, half a mat, um, and so that that. But now I th- now I gather there's a hotel up there, which is a bit depressing. I'd rather there wasn't a hotel. Um, mm-hmm. you know, there's there's lots of lots of stuff reminiscent of old Japan. There's more chance that you're going to find old Japan in the north than in other parts of the country. I think. Well, thank you for sharing your stories with me today, Leslie. It's I, I enjoyed reading about uh, that part of the part of Japan that I visit the most, and uh, but at an earlier time. And it was a pleasure to revisit the world of Basho. It's great to see on the narrow road to the deep north, joining the wonderful Eland Library. I'm very happy. I'm very pleased that Eland has very has brought it out again. It's wonderful that it's back in print as a book, as a proper book that people can read. It's great. Great to talk to you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Personal Landscapes. If you like the podcast, please give it a rating on iTunes and subscribe through your favorite app. You can find links to today's podcast and more conversations on books about place at ryanbernard.com. You'll also find a donate button if you'd like to contribute to the costs of the show. All donations are greatly appreciated.